Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Um, every year, the Engineering Council hosts an engineering intern event with the pipeline of new prospective engineers for Corning. This is always a wonderful opportunity for the students to interact with senior engineering leaders of each of Corning's businesses. The role of the Engineering Council is to work collaborative, ooh, collaboratively across the corporation and drive broad engineering improvements around the world. Today's presenter will be Corning's Chief Engineer, Tom Kapak. He will cover Corning's history of innovation and technology deployment, as well as discuss the value of effective and efficient engineering. I will now turn this over to Tom. Okay. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for spending an hour with us. I am happy to see so many people joining. I'm watching as people are logging in and telling us where you're from and uh, what you're studying. If you let me uh, take the opportunity to talk about how engineers innovate at Corning, I'll work through the presentation in the next maybe 30 minutes or so, and we will leave plenty of time uh, at the end of the presentation for questions. There is a number of other engineering executives with me on the call from Corning today, um, and uh, I'll, I'm sure they will help me um, as those most challenging questions come up. So go ahead and change the slide. First, just to remind everybody, let's see, we can get that slide to change. There we go. This information, although it's in a public domain, we always remind people in Corning that we talk about things in Corning that should stay in Corning. Everything that I have in this presentation um, is available for public use, but we do remind everybody because of the sensitive intellectual property that we create in Corning, how important it is for all of us as Corning employees to make sure we protect that. This slide is in every presentation that we give uh, in the company. Okay, next slide, Michelle. First, a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name's Tom Kapek. I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, and State University of New York at Oneonta in what they call a 3-2 program. My engineering degree is in civil engineering and I joined Corning believably or unbelievably 34 years ago uh, as a design engineer using my civil engineering background. And as you can see, this long list of things that I've done in Corning, the way I think about this for my career, right, my physics degree from Oneonta and my civil engineering degree from Rensselaer prepared me to enter uh, industry and uh, I chose to come to work for Corning 34 years ago because of the great people that I interviewed with when I was uh, interviewing. Uh, and uh, as you can see, Corning's given me the opportunity to do a number of different things. Um, <clears throat> very quickly, I decided that uh, although I love civil engineering, civil engineering is not what I wanted to do my entire career, but I wanted to be an engineer. And uh, as you can see, I moved uh, a number of places, first and foremost, down to our Harrodsburg, Kentucky plant. And we have a video later that will show some of that. And spent the majority of my time in Corning uh, learning the glass businesses uh, for Corning. And I'll talk some about that. And came back to Corning, New York uh, in 2000s and uh, dedicated the rest of my career towards engineering. And uh, for those people on the call that do know me, I, they, they know I have my dream job right now to be Corning's chief engineer is very exciting. And I've been able to do that for the last six years now or so. Um, and uh, I'll uh, do my best to make sure I represent everything that's going on in Corning. Okay, next slide, Michelle. You know, one of the things that we do in Corning is, you know, let's start with the technology strategy. And uh, in the most simple words, we put this in this three, core technologies, four manufacturing and engineering platforms, and five market access platforms. Uh, this slide is a build. What's behind the three are the three core technologies that we use predominantly in our company, optical physics, glass ceramics, the four, oh, there we go, click glass ceramics, optical physics, uh, the five, four manufacturing and engineering platforms, vapor deposition, I'll talk about that, fusion, 
precision forming, which is a catch-all for a lot of things, but you'll see some of the videos that I have. This has been a core technology of a manufacturing and engineering for Corning for many years. And we exist in next click, five market access platforms, optical communications, mobile consumer electronics, display technologies, automotive and life sciences. And if you let me take the opportunity, I'll, I'll do a quick run through of those five market access platforms at the same time that I'm talking about these four manufacturing and engineering platforms that use our three core technologies. And this has been really important for Corning. In other words, we say three, four, five is invent in those three core technologies, make in the four manufacturing and engineering platforms and sell into our five market, market access platforms. So often we'll say invent, make and sell, which is the same for us as three, four and five. And typically, 80% of what we do in the company revolves around this three, four, five strategy. We do look outside of this for emerging technologies and other things, but in general, after 100 and almost 170 years, Corning knows what they're good at. And when we're good at these three technologies, four platforms and five market access platforms, we get to exist for another 160 or 70 years. Okay, next slide. So let's just think about the way we manage our innovation pipeline. And if you see, right, there we have a robust portfolio of markets, right, as well as a good balance of initiatives. The left side of the funnel, right, represents the many ideas that we identify, explore, and evaluate in the early stages of innovation. As you can see in the bottom of the slide, research, right, for those of us, many of us in Corning participate in research. We generate these tremendous amount of ideas. You know, ultimately, of course, we need to prioritize, right? We don't want to limit our choices in the research stages, but you know, at the time, you have to start to think about that. And as we move through research, development, and into manufacturing, where again, because an engineering engineer is giving this slide, we expect our engineers to participate in the earliest stages of research. In the beginning and middle stages of development, and of course, in manufacturing, right? Um, our engineers, right? Many of us in Corning, um, even uh, here in Corning, New York, participate in the early stages of research. Uh, people from engineering move back and forth between research, development, and manufacturing all the time. Um, and at the end of this funnel, right, is our opportunity for us to create these new business opportunities. From the many ideas to the very few but very profitable innovation pipeline, right? This process ensures that we create and deliver, right, the highest value opportunities for the corporation. Okay, next slide. And I think you'd the click, right? We, you know, in the cool part about Corning, and again, using that word very delicately, right? We have a long history of success, right? By combining, oh, don't click yet. By combining our technology capabilities, uh, with manufacturing and engineering expertise, right? We have a steady streamline of changing innovations for more than 165 years. Okay, now you can click, All right? You can, I'll ask this question later. How many people, right? would have ever known what a ribbon machine is. It's a, a, a process that was invented by Corning uh, more than 100 years ago, right? And it, was, it revolutionized, right, with Thomas Edison, the first electric light, as well as, very importantly, an economically uh, efficient way to mass produce them. You know, in the early days of light bulb production, they were made one at a time by somebody blowing glass through a metal rod into a mold. And as you can see here from this video, you know, over uh, a few years with some outstanding engineering and manufacturing expertise, Corning was able to invent the ribbon machine, which really revolutionized the way light bulbs are made and made lighting affordable uh, for people around the globe. Uh, ribbon machines are still in use today after more than 100 years, and every ribbon machine that was ever built was built by Corning, uh, not run by Corning anymore, but built by Corning. 
it's a really remarkable process. Um, very difficult to find out where they're operating today because incandescent bulbs are just not as popular as these. Okay, next slide. Developed a glass ceramics material that made it possible to write to go from extreme cold to extreme heat while remaining its uh, stability. Um, it's marketed as consumers into uh, corning wear and also today used for military applications where it's extremely important for us. And this is probably uh, something that your grandparents might still have in their home. And uh, if you look carefully, people would talk often about the corning blue flower that was part of this glass ceramic process. And interestingly enough, this development and research was made accidentally by Corning, you know, more than 50 years ago. And as you can see, it's a really remarkable material um, and the, really the foundation for many other things that we do in Corning. And again, uses that glass and glass ceramics core capability for our company. Okay, next slide. Did you know, right, that Corning invented Right, the first low loss optical fiber, which ushered in the communication revolution in the 70s. And today, Corning is continues to be one of the largest producers of optical fiber in the world. Um, and those engineers and scientists that work in this business have been working on improving this process for many years now, where production of optical fibers are made at uh, lightning fast speeds in our manufacturing operations. For those in the U.S., our manufacturing operations for optical fiber uh, are in the North Carolina area, um, just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, and in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, and this has been the backbone of one of our largest business units for many years now. Okay, next slide. Okay, did you know that Corning invented the ceramic substrate for catalytic converters, right? Uh, resulting in cars that produce, you know, 99% few emissions today than that they did in 1971. For those that work in this business, it's a remarkable opportunity, right, for us to think, you know, when our parents or grandparents might have uh, looked outside their window in large cities that they could hardly see across to the next building because of the pollution that was being created by, you know, gas combustion engines. Um, and the auto companies and the EPA came to Corning in the 70s and said, I need to come up with a way to reduce um, or to provide cleaner air. And Corning has been in this business now for more than 40 years and continues to be the market share leader and now uh, working very, very well uh, for us to do um, ceramic substrates for gas particulate as well. So not just catalytic converters, but also particulate removal from automobiles. Uh, a very large business unit for Corning as well. Um, and uh, we participate with uh, all of the la large uh, automobile companies. Okay, next slide. Did you know, right, that Corning created the liquid crystal display glass business in the late 80s uh, with a company called Sharp? Um, and today, uh, this fusion forming process, again, one of the four manufacturing and engineering platforms right, has uh, created extremely large sheets of glass, as you can see in the video, uh, in our manufacturing operations. Uh, one is in uh, Harrodsburg, Kentucky. The rest are actually in Asia for us, where we started in Japan, eventually went to Korea and Taiwan, and now are making large investments uh, in China with what we call Gen 10, which is the generation of the size of the glass. And, basically three meters by three meters, a uh, piece of glass that's the thickness of a mechanical pencil at 0.5 millimeters, and it's used to make very large TVs. So for all of you that might have a, not just a desktop monitor, but a large TV in your home, very likely that the glass that's uh, made for that display has come from Corning Incorporated. 
Okay, next slide. Did you know, and maybe you do, right? This is the invention from uh, Corning Gorilla Glass, right? Developed this new composition, exceptionally thin, lightweight, and scratch and damage resistant. And as the story now gets told, right, when Steve Jobs came to Corning back in 2007 and said, I'm going to be introducing a new phone to the world, and I'm not, I do not want to put plastic on the outside of that phone. I want to put glass. But every time I put glass on my phone and I put my phone in my pocket with my keys and my wrenches and other things, I end up scratching the glass. Corning, you need to come up with a way to invent this glass. And uh, Corning Gorilla Glass was invented more than 10 years ago and is the market share leader for every mobile consumer device today. Um, and, uh, we can say, I think, quoted best by a senator from the state of Kentucky, it's the last thing you touch at night and the first thing you touch in the morning is a piece of corning glass, uh, most likely because most of us go with our phones by the side of our bed and it's the thing we take with us and bring with us the next day. Um, and this is a remarkable process and really an invention, reinvention of a process that Corning had invented uh, back in the 60s actually to make windshields um, and uh, didn't work out so well for Corning, but that invention came back again. Uh, the other part of Gorilla Glass today that you'll hear a lot about is uh, putting Gorilla Glass inside of your automobile. So uh, many of the automobiles today will have large touch screens inside them uh, that need to be damaged, scratch resistant and uh, optically clear. And uh, Corning is investing significantly in business opportunities for auto interior uh, business uh, for glass and Gorilla Glass. Okay, next slide. And most recently, and uh, very exciting for Corning, um, you have heard anything lately, uh, two or three years ago, Corning was at the White House um, uh, introducing this uh, Valor uh, pharmaceutical glass packaging, which is an opportunity for us to uh, uh, solve some pretty significant problems that exist in the drug storage and delivery businesses, which helps us protect uh, patient safety and improve pharmaceutical manufacturing. And most recently, Corning was granted more than $200 million to make our investment uh, in Valor glass. And, what Valor Glass is, in most simple terms, it's a Gorilla Glass that uh, we use uh, composition-wise and create a glass vial. I in exchange it, coat it, and uh, now have been able to create this packaging opportunity for us. And as we all know, with the COVID-19 issues, um, glass uh, will be the method by which uh, we'll we'll have uh, the packaging made for uh, those uh, things that will help us down the road from a COVID perspective and. This has become a very big opportunity for Corning, especially uh, over the last uh, few months or so. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so you can see, right, we have a long history of life-changing innovations. Um, personally, I believe the greatest innovations are still ahead, right? Um, why do I believe that? Let's take a look, right? Uh, one of our core competencies uh, is in glass, so go ahead and change the slide. And I'm going to see if Michelle can start the video. I'm going to turn my sound off so that I don't get anything. In the middle of bluegrass and bourbon country in Harrodsburg, Kentucky, is Corning's oldest glass factory. This facility was built for ophthalmic glass pressing in the early 1950s. And then in the 1980s, we transitioned into the fusion forming process to make LCD glass that grew into a enormous business for us within Corning. But about six months before the first iPhone was released in 2007, Steve Jobs made a call to the CEO of Corning and asked the company to create glass that could withstand scratches and breakage for a new Apple product. Before that, phones were typically covered in plastic. Corning quickly developed Gorilla Glass, and this factory went through a complete transformation. We leveraged the fusion forming technology to make Gorilla Glass and to make the first composition of Gorilla Glass here in Harrodsburg. Since 2007, I could say that the Harrodsburg plant has undergone a number of innovations to support all of the new Gorilla Glasses as they've transitioned to stronger and more scratch resistant and more durable glass. 
The same company that developed the glass for the Edison bulb in 1879 is now making the glass that covers 6 billion smartphones, tablets, screens, and wearables worldwide. We got a rare look inside Corning's flagship Gorilla Glass factory to find out how it's made. Robots and massive machines are continuously making glass 24-7 here. It starts with a mix of materials that are sourced from all over the world. Here we are in the mix house. This is really where the heart and the start of the Gorilla Glass composition begins. Some people may think that glass is just sand, but it really isn't. There's a lot of complex science that goes into Gorilla Glass specifically. It is extremely important that we have a strong and robust recipe. So as you think about how you make your cake at home, similar to that, we have fine-tuned and evolved the process for making glass over decades. What you can see in the facility are screw feeders and feeding systems that will take that material and transition it into a large bowl where it will be mixed so that we ensure that the mixture is homogeneous and can create the best glass possible. One bag, as you see here, once it's filled, will actually turn into thousands of sheets of Gorilla Glass. The raw material then travels up seven stories to the top of the factory, where it enters an impressive, giant machine that melts the raw material to hot molten glass over the course of days. The lava-like glass then flows down several stories while it cools and strengthens in a process called fusion forming. To describe our fusion forming process, if you imagine a trough and the glass comes into the top of that trough and then flows over the edges of the trough down to the point where it fuses together, it's really fusing together in air and nothing touches that pristine surface. So both sides of the glass are pristine as it transitions down multiple stories to the bottom of our process where it's then scored and separated into discrete sheets. Fusion forming process is capable of making thicknesses of glass over two millimeters down to 100 microns or dot one millimeter, which is just larger than the size of a strand of hair. The glass comes out of the fusion process in sheets that are cut as big as nine feet by 10 feet. Only robots touch the glass throughout the process. So as the glass transitions to this final step before it gets shipped and packed, realize that the glass has never been touched by human hands. When it gets to this final step, we laminate the glass to protect it both for shipping and to allow our customers to handle the glass as they pull the sheets out of the crates. Once it's loaded into crates, the glass is then shipped off for finishing, which is done all over the world depending on the preference of the device manufacturer. Gorilla Glass is one of the toughest glasses out there. And what makes it tough is not only what you see here, because it actually hasn't obtained all of its strength at this point. After it's packed and shipped, it goes through a chemical strengthening process called an ion exchange process. The composition that we set up allows us to then take a finished sheet of glass, put it into a bath of hot salt, and in that bath of hot salt, sodium ions are exchanged for larger potassium ions in the glass. And if you imagine those larger potassium ions pack into that glass, causing a much tighter and stronger compressive area on the glass. And that's really what gives the glass its strength. Corning employs 400 people at this factory, many of whom are focused on quality control and research. As device manufacturers demand thinner and sleeker phones, Corning is constantly having to update and improve Gorilla Glass. What makes Gorilla Glass so strong is the unique composition and glass science behind the glass that allows us to create this compressive layer that when it is ion exchange, creates really a, a layer of armor and an extra strength that other glasses are not capable of doing. Okay, I'm back. Amy Porter, um, <clears throat> actually uh, a remarkable uh, career with Corning. It continues to be, I think, uh, if I remember, Amy started her career in our optical fiber business, uh, working out of our Wilmington, North Carolina plant. Uh, and after maybe 10 years or so there, with great careers in manufacturing and engineering, moved to our Harrodsburg, Kentucky plant. Um, first, as what we call our operations manager, uh, which is the person responsible for the 
daily operations. Uh, probably one of the most exciting jobs uh, anyone can have. I had that job once uh, back in actually in Harrodsburg for a few years, uh, making sure that the ongoing operations are there. And then uh, she moved in to uh, operate our uh, plant as plant manager, which is basically the person who's responsible for everything that happens inside of the plant. Uh, actually, two of us that are on the call were both plant managers also in Harrodsburg, Will Shermer, uh, who's uh, now our engineering uh, director, VP for our environmental technologies business and myself. Um, and Amy's done that for the last few years. And interestingly enough, uh, also just to give you an, an idea of uh, how career progressions go, Amy is now on an expat assignment uh, with her family uh, living in Taiwan uh, and responsible for all of our manufacturing operations around the world for uh, display technologies. Um, and uh, Amy has done a fabulous job, especially when she was in Harrodsburg, uh, uh, bringing everything together. Uh, this next slide is uh, just a little bit of an idea, you know, about our re recruiting, right? And uh, we're, you know, given everything that was going on with uh, COVID-19, we thought it was best, uh, you know, suspend, if I can use that word, our summer internship. It is one of the most important things that Corning does. We will continue to do that. Uh, so many of us in uh, the early parts of our uh, education were had the opportunity to get, uh, you know, real life uh, engineering experiences, uh, working around engineers, working for companies like Corning. Those are so valuable to all of us when we're uh, in school. Um, on a personal note, uh, I have four daughters, uh, three of them went to school to be engineers. The youngest just graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and had uh, a couple of summer internships throughout her career, which positioned her extremely well. Uh, she's going to go work for Merck, uh, the pharmaceutical company, uh, just in a few weeks here. But those summer experiences are really important. And as you can see here, right, real projects, uh, getting experiences in our facilities, understanding how engineers work, right? We, you know, we recruit into a lot of major disciplines. The top five we recruit um, and in no particular order, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, materials, material science, computer science, electrical engineering, even hire civil engineers once in a while, um, myself and many others, right? So, you know, and in many cases, our engineers can come into Corning and uh, be the best in the world at chemical engineering if that's what they want to do, because by gosh, we need great chemical engineers and material engineers. Or they can come into Corning and use their engineering background to do a number of different things, um, moving throughout our corporation, uh, whether it be in R&D, engineers end up in finance, they end up in information technology, they end up in supply chain, they end up all over our company. Uh, we have a strong network, right, of universities that we map into to make sure that our alumni are active on those campuses, make sure that we're giving back to the campuses and having the opportunity to talk to students while we're there. Um, so this is a really healthy portfolio of things that we do. In general, the statistic in Corning from an engineering perspective, about half of the engineers in Corning uh, maybe there's a slide that will come up. About half of the about 5,000 engineers in Corning have less than five years experience with Corning. But although you might be talking to somebody with 34 years of experience at Corning, there are a lot of people in Corning uh, that have just joined, uh, and it's a great opportunity for us to make sure that we get them off on a great start. Okay, next slide. And here's the, a little bit more about engineering. There's the way we, in, in very simple terms, we uh, organize our engineering structure at the top of the company uh, by those that are we call plant engineers, those engineers that uh, work in our manufacturing operations day in and day out. Uh, Corning has about 60 to 70 manufacturing operations around the world where plant engineers are a significant part of what we do. And as you can see there, they're owning day-to-day -day operations, they're driving cost reduction, they're receiving capability improvements, they're improving existing and bringing in new processes. Many of us in our time at Corning, myself included, about a third of my career was actually as a plant engineer. The next slide, next click. 
there's a group that we call division engineering for all of our five market access platforms we have a group of people who are owning the responsibility for what's going on in the division those are the division engineering managers many of them are on the call with us today and they own those things that are need to be owned for that division if we need to be the best in the world at extruding ceramic substrates or producing flat glass infusion our division engineering organizations have that responsibility here again many of our division engineering organizations are actually located in our manufacturing operations getting our engineers as close to our manufacturing operations and some of those division engineers are also co-located with our research and development organizations. And as you can see here, they have very specific responsibilities. The third tier of this is manufacturing technology and engineering. It can also be called corporate engineering. It has the responsibility to own those things that are broadly applied across the company. A good example might be ceramic engineering or metallurgy, uh, material science, those things that are used in all of our business units and there's expertise built up in MTE so that the plants and the divisions should leverage the corporate function as necessary to drive improvements in their organizations. And the manufacturing technology and engineering organization does act as the manufacturing and engineering function for new businesses that are being created. So those three groups together make engineering as a whole for our corporation. Next slide. I think is the slide that talks about about how many and it's really difficult sometimes to count engineers but i can say that uh, our engineers are located around the world uh, as you can see the majority of the engineers uh, work in our manufacturing operations right in our plants as we call them here right uh in the next largest group because we have five of them or more they're actually working in our uh division engineering groups and then manufacturing and then the other thing that you can see here all right if there's a do crayon math right more than five thousand people right um more than half of them live outside of the united states today right and we have very large engineering structures uh, especially in asia where some of our largest plants are that produce uh, optical fibers that produce flat glass for display and that produce uh, catalytic converters for automobiles. Um, so this has a, been an evolving opportunity for our company. Um, and of course, our engineering managers that are on the call here have global responsibility. And we think about even moving our engineers, as I mentioned with Amy Porter, uh, moving our engineers and manufacturing operations people on expat assignments either to the U.S. or from the U.S. to Asia. And boy, that was a lot easier to do before COVID-19. Uh, next slide. Just quick here, the, everything that I just talked about in pie chart form, you can see uh, you know, where our engineers work and then where they live. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity for people who work in Corning, uh, either to move around the United States or move around the world, or just know that you're gonna work on a global team with almost everything that we do. Okay, next slide. Um, this is uh, what we call the Corporate Engineering Council. Uh, don't worry, uh, many of them are on the call with us, but not all. And what it does is represent the, the engineering directors and VPs of engineering that have the responsibility with me to make sure that engineering as a function in our company is operating as it needs to in our company. Um, each one of these people have a very specific responsibility for their business unit. Um, many of them are on the call, and as questions come up, they can introduce themselves and talk with you about or answer any of your questions. Um, and again, this organization with me um, is is the responsible party for engineering for everything that happens in our comp in our company. Okay, next slide. I think we're at the last one. Now let's just not forget people, right? I think this is extremely important for us at Corning, right? Everything we do, right, these seven values, we talk about these all the time, seven values, all seven, all the time, all around the world. These are the that define who we are and how we work at Corning, right? For people like me that to work at Corning my entire career, these are the seven reasons I choose to work for Corning. 
the, you know, the quality of the people work, the performance, the innovation, the individual, our integrity, leadership, our independence, right? And people are part of all of that. Morning has about 50,000 people that work with us worldwide. As I mentioned, there's at least 5,000 or more engineers. If we include our research and development organizations, there's more than 10,000 people in our company that work in the innovation space, right? And then, of course, there's everybody that we have to have in our manufacturing operations that make these things come true every day. And we do say this, and we do believe it. If we didn't, I wouldn't work for Corning. You know, people are our most important assets. Um, because without those people, right, innovation just wouldn't happen. And uh, we wouldn't be around another 169 years now. Okay, next slide. And I think that's it. We're going to open it up for Q&A. Perfect. I'm a few minutes late, but uh, I appreciate everybody paying attention and uh, listening. And I saw a lot of questions come across the screen. Jessica, are you going to facilitate? The Q and A. Yes, there you go. I'm going to hand the um, floor back over to you. Okay. Perfect. Oh, I'm going. Let me just double check. There's a lot of feedback. Make sure everybody's mute. Okay. Um. Our first question is: Do you consider hiring biomedical engineers for departments other than life sciences? Which departments could I research for internship and job opportunities? I will answer that, and please, if there's somebody uh, else that wants to help from it. Yes, we do, um, it's, it's especially in our life sciences business, but again, not only in our life sciences business. When we hire biomedical engineer, it, it is very, uh, you know, again, if they have my daughter, and again, a personal story, she is a biomedical engineer from Rensselaer. Uh, she did work for Corning uh, for at least two summers. One of the summers was up in our Kenny Bunkport main plant, which is part of our life sciences business, and had a remarkable experience up there with uh, the introduction of a process called HyperStack, um, which is a revolutionary process that we use for cell discovery. Um, so not only, but predominantly in our Corning Life Sciences business. And Corning Life Sciences business is one of our biggest growth business today because of everything that's happening with COVID-19, plus the pharmaceutical packaging opportunity they, we have with Valor Glass. Uh, biomedical engineers would also work very closely with us in our research and development organization, because typically biomedical engineers want to go to school for at least their master's and maybe their PhD, which would um, have them be um, very valuable to a company like Corning, especially as engineers participate in research and development. Perfect, thank you. Um, bouncing off of the last question, how important is your choice of major in hiring? I've heard many engineers say they work on something totally different from what they studied in school. Well, I'll start with that and then I'll let somebody else chime in. I am the perfect poster child for that. I went to school for physics and civil engineering. And frankly speaking, it's not, I love both of those majors as part of my major. And um, I did civil engineering for Corning for about the first two years. And I fell in love with so many other aspects of engineering. And what engineers do is we solve problems, right? So. That's what we get paid to do. The problem could be solved by a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and any engineering. And in general, we use our engineering skills to solve problems. Over time, when we become managers, what we do is define problems better so that our engineers solve the right problems. And it takes years to get to that point, which is many of the people on the call with me, they've all started getting their hands you know, dirty, as we say, uh, solving problems. And in many ways over time, what our careers become is, can we help define the problem so that we can solve the problem? Both of those things are extremely important as part of your education. Think about what you're doing in schools today. Your professors are defining problems for you. You're working on solving them. Over time, you'll start to also define new problems that need to be solved. Anybody else from the EC want to join in on that? You'll have to take yourself off mute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, 
just chime in, Tom, that was a great answer. My name is John Balad. I'm the director for division engineering for display. And uh, I have a degree in mechanical engineering, although um, when I joined the company, I start, started as a manufacturing sh shift supervisor, and I've had positions in both uh, manufacturing operations and also uh, plant engineering, division engineering. But my passion, uh, even though the company wanted me to be an equipment engineer because I had a mechanical engineering degree, I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to work in glass processing and and uh, more specifically, I found I loved um, hot glass melting and forming. So um, there's plenty of opportunities and a lot of people that I found some of the most the, the, the smartest, most gifted uh, melting engineers we have don't have a degree in ceramic engineering or chemical engineering. They're just awesome uh, process engineers. Yeah. Great, John, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, next question is, can you please talk about the computational type of work at Corning in the R&D department? I'm going to see if Will Shermer wants to take a shot at that. He he works very closely with our research and development group and is today also has development reporting into his organization. Will, I'll put you on the spot. Okay, no problem. Are you able to hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, so I'm Will Shermer. I'm responsible for uh, development and engineering in the Corning Environmental Technology Organization. Uh, and you know, computational work is has always been important in Corning. It's becoming so much more important, though, as uh, we, as well as many uh, other companies, get into what folks call uh, manufacturing 4.0. It's really the fourth epoch of manufacturing that really is about the universe of things and the connectivity between things. Uh, very apropos for a manufacturing uh, corporation. Uh, we've got a uh, a nascent uh, emerging, I guess I would say, uh, uh, data analytics uh, competency that's being built. It's uh, centered in uh, S&T with a, a strong uh, toehold under Sam Zuby and mt and &E. But uh, most of us in the operating divisions as well are uh, developing small groups of data scientists that really help us solve problems in non-traditional uh, ways using machine learning and advanced data visualization techniques to better understand what's going on uh, in modeled uh, situations, uh, simulations, and ultimately through experimentation uh, in our factories to improve our processes. It's a super exciting field. I personally think it's going to be a competitive differentiator uh, among companies uh, uh, that are competing on otherwise equal uh, uh, playing fields and uh, truly believe that uh, uh, if we get in and do this well early, uh, we're going to be uh, the winners. If we uh, don't do that, uh, not our plan, uh, we would be uh, laggers. And so it's just so important that we that we expand and, and excel in this field, in my opinion. Thank you. Awesome. Um, what have you found to be the most effective way to organize an engineering team? All right, I'm going to I'm going to delegate that one too. I'm going to maybe Charlie Rizzo, are you on? I'm, I need yes, to get I am. Yeah, I think. I, and again, I'll, I'll let Charlie introduce himself. And uh, Charlie has been a part of uh, most engineering organizations I've been a part of. And I think Charlie would be great to answer this question. Sure, I can take a spin on it. Uh, again, Charlie Rizzo, I'm the division engineering manager for advanced optics, which is one of the smaller divisions in Corning. And as Tom said, I've actually been in multiple divisions in Corning. It speaks a little bit to the question earlier about the importance of a certain degree. Uh, my degree is in mechanical engineering, specializing in heat transfer in my graduate degree. Uh, but I worked in initially photonics with Corning, which had very little to do with my degree. Then I moved on to work on high-speed vision systems. Uh, then I finally went into melting. I thought that maybe I could use my... Uh, my heat transfer degrees, uh, and uh, ultimately went uh, back into optics here in advanced optics. So I've, I've touched a number of engineering organizations. 
And what I can say is I don't think there is any one magic organizational method for an engineering group. Um, it highly depends on what is the purpose of that group and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, if, for example, some groups may organize themselves by engineering discipline, and that may work for a larger organization or for an organization, you know, depending on their type of product. In advanced optics, as an example, we are not actually organized by discipline. We're organized by the type of product that we make because so many of our products are very specialized or customized products that we organize around those products because they're so varied um, that we, you know, we, we put our people and match their skills to the type of product that we're trying to make. So I think it just depends on what you're trying to do. The key part is that you actually think about it, right? I think too often we um, either accept what's uh, been dealt to us or we just say, well, this is you know, typically how it's done. And I think it's more important that you ask that question and you evaluate how should my organization be structured to be most effective and typically it takes a little trial and error to find what may be the optimum solution for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charlie. Awesome. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, we have so many good questions. So, right. um, is it possible to be an expat right after being hired, especially if we speak the languages of the areas we would be hired to? Mm, I'm trying to figure out who I want to send that one to. Everything's possible. John Vallad, I'm going to go back to you and then only because John is on an expat assignment and has been on an expat assignment for many years. I know Charlie and others have too, but John, are you okay to just do a quick answer on that one? And, and your group has probably the most expats of any group right now. So, so uh, just for clarification, the question was, is it, is it possible to be an expat immediately after uh, joining the company. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, well, the, the answer, I think Tom's used this expression a couple times before is uh, anything's possible. Um, Tom sent me on a, uh, a two year expat assignment to Japan um, 14 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we do have a lot of expats around the world. And uh, it all depends on um, the uh, uh, the person's position that they're filling, uh, their skills, their competency, and the needs that we need to fill uh, overseas, which are considerable and are varied. We do a lot of of our development um, in Corning, New York, or in the U.S. Uh, there's a lot of uh, younger, uh, uh, en great engineers and scientists that are doing a lot of our development for us, and they actually um, migrate the technology or they move with new technology overseas. So it's very possible early on in your career uh, to work on an innovation that needs to be migrated uh, over to Asia for uh, manufacturing, and you and you are the expert. You are the one that moves with the technology uh, to migrate the technology. Right. So typically, yes. yep. Thanks, Sean. Typically, it would start with somebody maybe a project assignment. Uh, we have, uh, Will and his team, or many others, are on project assignments for some period of time. It could be for weeks to months, to you know, and then it could turn into expat assignments. Of course, having multiple language skills. Um, doesn't hurt, right? That is extremely important for us. But remember that we're building our engineering organizations around the world. So, it, you know, to say it can absolutely happen, you know, tip, it is case by case and it is project by project. And then eventually, I'm going to say this, right? If you're really good at what you do, really good things happen to you. If you're worried about your next job and worried about this or that, that, that is, and I think no matter what company you work for, I don't, you know, I, I, when I'm saying that, that's only about corning, right? But things happen to good people, like John said, right? And when you're good at what you do, people are going to want you no matter where you are. If, you know, if you're your best uh, or your only um, 
advocate, that's a problem. And so for all of our young engineers, and we do, again, it's all about getting them the right experiences in the first few years. I'll start, I would give, you know, it is about self-discovery, right, for us as young engineers. And the, it's the simple model. What do I like to do? What do I do well? And can I find a company that values that? It's what I like to do might not be what I do well, or what I like to do and what I do well might not be valued by Corning. Go, go work someplace else, right? It is about self-discovery. And if we're engineers, the interesting part about that, especially as Corning, is we let you discover yourself once you're here. I discovered that I loved civil engineering, but it isn't what I wanted to do for my whole career. And Corning let me discover a few other things about myself. I guess I was pretty good at it because I could have discovered I wanted to do something else, but wasn't very good at it. I probably wouldn't get to the chair I'm in today. And I can't just be good once. I have to be good all the time. I can't be, you know, well, that was a great project and never have another good one. So there is, a, there is a lot of that that we all learn about ourselves once we get to whatever company we show up at, right? What do I love to do? What do I do well? And can I find a company that values that? Because if you find something you love to do and that you do well, and you're going to want to work there for 30 or 40 years. Sorry to say, young kids, you're, you know, the likelihood of you know, retiring after 10 years is not high. It might happen. Go for it, right? But the likelihood is you better find something you love to do that you do well. I'll stop with that. Maybe just to offer one more comment. Yeah, just please. one yeah. comment. The question was specifically about expats. And I was an expat for four years in Germany once upon a time in the early 90s. Yeah. But if the spirit of the, of, the, of the question is really, can I work overseas for an extended period of time? That's different than the expat question. There are many, many assignments for very junior engineers mm -hmm. uh, outside of Corning, New York, outside of their native country uh, or country of employment. And that happens all the time. You know, we yeah. literally send folks after three months of orientation right into the field to solve problems and implement technology. So if what you're looking for is a chance to work around the world and get to know new, new cultures, uh, you don't have to be an expat to do that. There's lots yeah. of opportunity for that. That's right. Thing. Great. Yeah, great. Well, yep. That's good. I actually believe we had an intern that we were supposed to have this summer that would have been overseas for part of their internship as yeah. well. So that is definitely something. Um, okay, so then actually, Amanda, I see your question. I think we pretty much covered that. Um, Tom inadvertently answered it with his yeah. last answer. So moving to the next one, um, are there opportunities for structural engineers at Corning? If so, how could I search for that? For an internship, which department should I be looking at, and so on? Maybe Rose or Derwin, do you want to take that from our facilities engineering group within MTE or just knowing other things in the company? Sure, this is Derwin Nelson. I'll take a start at it, and then Rose, you can add into it. So I'm uh, Derwin Nelson, the director of early manufacturing and standards. I've been with Corning, uh, one of those longtime employees like Tom was talking about over 30 years. And the first 25 years was in optical communications out of North Carolina. And the last five years, uh, working with Tom and the MT group in Corning, New York. Um, from a structural engineering standpoint, within the corporate engineering of the MT organization, uh, we have a, a capital and facilities projects group, uh, and they do have structural, structural engineers that work on uh, our building designs, expansions, renovations. Um, and so we do hire quite a few structural engineers in that organization, as well as great program managers to help us manage those types of projects. Within each division, within a lot of the division engineering groups, if you noticed on the division engineering slide, um, capital expansions, project expansions is a responsibility of most division engineering groups. And they also will have uh, structural engineers or project engineers uh, within the division engineering groups as well. So yes, there are opportunities for that type of role uh, at the corporate level as well as within the division levels. Awesome, thank you. Perfect, Derwin, um, thanks, yep. During your time as chief engineer, what contribution to Corning are you most proud of? 
Well, I'm most proud that they let me be an engineer still, even though I have this other job, which is really a great job. And like I said, I, for those people that know me, I, it's my dream job. I, I love the fact that um, because the people I work for are perfectly fine with that. If I see something that needs to a, a lend a hand where I can go someplace, I will get on a plane, get on a train, get in an automobile and go someplace, right? So um, those are the most exciting. And, and uh, recently, you know, I was asked to go see if I could help this morning make uh, some of the thinnest glass in the world and spent a couple of weeks uh, just before the COVID opportunity in France, um, working with the team on the ground there. And like all the other engineering managers, uh, we get to roll up our sleeves um, and, uh, you know, put on our steel toed boots uh, and go out and work with our engineers to help solve problems. And like I said, in many cases, it's helping them to find what the problem is so that we are very efficient at solving the problem. So for me, the most recent one was getting my hands dirty and in this case, getting on a plane and uh, going to France for a couple of weeks uh, and helping the team untangle a very challenging uh, technical opportunity that we had. And in many ways, then helping them do that and then get out of their way um, and letting them execute it. Um, that is the best part of for all of us of being engineers is that uh, in many cases, all cases, right, they are people we work for and the people who are on the call, we, we're all expected to be able to roll up our sleeves and uh, go do work if that's what needs to get done and make sure that we can get out there. And in part of doing that work, we're also training and educating our young engineers, um, you know, giving back to others because others helped us to do that when we were young in our career too. Awesome. Um, what are the conferences or scientific meetings that your advanced engineers attend? Let's see who I want to give that one to. Vinu, I know you're on the call. Do you want to talk about, because I think there's so much stuff going on in the life sciences industry. Yes, uh, Tom, thank you. <clears throat> so good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, so I'm the uh, director for uh, life sciences. So I'll take a minute to just uh, just provide my, uh, you know, what my journey was uh, coming to where I am right now in my position. So I started in shipbuilding, nothing to do with life sciences. I was in automotive after that, then on to consumer electronics and now in life sciences. I think what I really love is applying uh, what I would say engineering principles in this case to material science to bring solutions to the medicine and healthcare industry. So I think it's fascinating to apply what you learn in school towards uh, towards Tom and others talked about solving problems and, uh, you know, make a difference. Um, I think the question around, you know, what conferences, so I'm going to speak specifically to the, uh, in the life sciences space or in the bioengineering space, you know, what do we do? Um, so we, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is around uh, vessels and what we do with surface modification. So how do you change the surfaces? Uh, and then, you know, how do you assemble these vessels, whether it is a, a vial that was talked about in the video and or more advanced surfaces like was talked about in Hyperstack as a product. So whether it is in, you know, publishing papers or attending everything from, you know, uh, expositions around the polymer space, surface modification uh, uh, sciences, uh, you know, whether it's collaborating with other universities, so it's not just the uh, you know the the knowledge from attending conferences, but also who do you partnership with in terms of universities and or even national labs? I mean, these are all places that we look for in how we want to advance ourselves. So I think it's a it's a it's a rather open question in the sense uh, you know if there's an interest in a certain area or a certain field, uh, you know we would uh, ensure that uh, you know resources can attend and learn from those uh, those events. Yep. Well, that, well said, Vinu, I think, and, and it's, you know, not especially, but right now, especially in life sciences, the exponential learning that's going on, right? And the ability to share that globally will be extremely important for all companies that are, you know, in the war and the fight against COVID. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Jessica. 
We do have a couple more questions, but I just want to check in because we are at the hour. We can go over and answer the last couple questions, but um, I want to be mindful of your time as well. I'm okay to stay on and we'll okay. see if others can and maybe try to wrap it up in the next five or 10 minutes or the most. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. How often can someone move around in different departments? So working yeah. on something like cooler glass to something like pharmaceutical glass packaging. I'm going to again. I'm going to try to engage every. I think Rose. We have not heard from Rose yet. Rose has got like a lot of the same experiences that us. We that uh, where we are today isn't where we started, or where we'll be tomorrow isn't where we are today. So, uh, Rose, you want to give that one a shot? you're on. Maybe. Maybe Rose has left. I just took her off mute. Oh, <laughs> oh so you didn't hear any of that. I'll start nope. over. It was great though, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, Rose Coluccio. I work in mt &E, corporate engineering. Uh, my degree is mechanical engineering. And I immediately launched into process engineering in a manufacturing site. So that was the question of, you know, your degree and maybe doing something different. I found I really loved process engineering and uh, then project management. So this moving around in departments, probably the best way to describe that maybe is a, just a quick flyby of my own experience, which is not unlike many of those on the phone. Um, I've worked in seven different manufacturing plants in four different divisions. So I started my career in Energizer, and then I joined Corning and Photonics, moved to mt &E, or corporate engineering, and then into the environmental division. And uh, now I'm back in mt &E into this corporate engineering role. So you, we do have the ability to move around between businesses, but one of the things that you'll find is to move and advance in your career spending time in one business is really helpful because then you get to know the business, you get to take on larger assignments, take on larger projects or leading larger teams. So you get to grow and advance in a division and then maybe stepping sideways into another division to get another growth experience is something that we do. Um, some people spend their whole career in a division because they go deep into technology and continue to lead. So it, it's a little bit like Tom was describing, um, you find your way. You know, what do you find that you love and excel in? And then people will also match you with those opportunities because they can tell where your passion is, what you're good in, and it's all just be excellent at what you do and the opportunities will present themselves. So I think that answers it. Can you move around different departments? The answer is clearly yes, you can. And uh, definitely lots of opportunities within Corning because we have lots of different businesses and uh, whether it's starting in research or all the way through manufacturing. Thank you, Rose. And then I think this is our last question. How common are advanced degrees at Corning in plant engineering in particular? I'm sorry, Laura, Jessica, say that again. How, com How common are advanced How common? degrees at Corning in plant engineering in particular? I'll start, and then I, I Kent McConnell's on. We haven't had heard from him yet. Uh, you, you know what? I love it when PhDs work in, as plant engineers. Trust me, just the word plant. Don't take that as well. That's just where people start, and you know, people without advanced degrees should work in plant ed. Our best plant engineers, right? In many cases, right are people who have their PH degree. One of my favorite people who grew up in our state college, Pennsylvania plan, a PhD from Pennsylvania State University, uh, Dr. Gautam Kudva, right? One of our most talented engineering uh, technology managers today, all because he, right, took what he did uh, as a PhD engineer working in our manufacturing operations. And there are probably too many to count uh, people who have those advanced degrees. And, and frankly speaking, right, having that advanced degree and then getting them to work in our manufacturing operation gives them such an appreciation for how to make something. So that when we, or when they decide to go back into more of a research role, how much more valuable they are to the company because connecting, inventing, and making is the most challenging thing we do. 
inventing something I can't make doesn't count, right? That so that is extremely important. And I, we haven't heard from you. I just want you know expand on that if you don't mind, right? You've seen all kinds, right? Uh, maybe not, uh, you know, in in your career as well. Anything else that you want to add? Yeah, I'll just add real quick. So, Kent McConnell, I'm Division Engineering Leader for Corning Pharmaceutical Technologies, and, and I really just kind of add, we're, we're a company that makes things, right? You know, Tom covered earlier, invent, make, and sell. And if we invent things we can't make or sell, that that's kind of pointless. And I encourage everyone, you know, even as I'm in division engineering when we recruit people um, and young engineers, uh, regardless of degree, I really encourage them to be out on the plant floor and in a manufacturing. The best experience you get is in a plant. And so whether you start with an advanced degree and you come in and work at a plant or you come into a plant and you say, hey, I'd look to advance my career and I want to go back to school, both of those are okay. Um, but getting that experience on the manufacturing floor is really the most important. Yep. Excellent. Thanks, Kent. All right, Jessica. Yeah, um, I think that was our last question. We had a lot of um, really excited thank yous in the comments. So um, thank you everybody for your time. Tom, this was a great presentation. Um, I really appreciate you bringing so many people onto the call to provide their expertise and their experience. Um, this was really valuable for the students. So, well, th Thank um, you, Jessica. And, and thanks to all the students that joined the call. I, you know, um, your, your classes are going to be very interesting over the next few years, right? We hope you all get the chance to go back to school in person, right? Uh, this August and September. It'll be interesting to see how that all works out. You'll, you'll all have that little footnote uh, in your college uh, education where, you know, I'm a COVID kid, right? I went to school or I didn't graduate on the same plan. I didn't, you're, you know what? And here's the, what I'll leave you with, right? No better time to be an engineer, right? Pick any engineering discipline. You're mm -hmm. going to help us solve problems. Think about all the engineers in the world that are working on COVID-19. Think about, think about how, that problem will get solved. That problem will get solved with engineers and scientists. If, right, when we do this, we will solve this problem. It will be solved because we can now define the problem better. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? How do we use everything that's available to us in all of our institutions and with all of our corporations? Look at what's happening in the world today with corporations. Everybody's leaning into solving this problem. And it's not just pharmaceutical, it's Corning Incorporated, right? It's pharmaceutical companies, it's companies that are making ventilators that my brother works for Ford Motor Company and he used to make transmissions and about two months ago, he started making ventilators, right? So to, what, not a more exciting time to be an engineer, in my opinion, right? Oh my gosh, because here's another problem that we have to solve and it will be solved with scientists and engineers, right? No matter what your discipline is, right? Because that is what we get paid to do. And if you love to solve problems, then you're in the right field, right? If you love the ability to get at solving those problems, then this is a really exciting time to be uh, in a university or coming to work for a company and helping them solve problems. So I'll leave it with that. Um, congratulations to all of you as you continue your education. And I look forward to seeing maybe some of you at Corning next summer as summer interns or coming to work for us for that matter. Okay, mm -hmm. Jessica, it's all yours. All right, well, I am going to close it out. So again, thank you to Tom and the entire engineering council for um, joining us today. Uh, the presentation was great. Thank you to all the students that attended. We appreciate your time and interest and the great dialogue that came from it. So I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.